Well, that's the closest I'm ever going to get to walking down a catwalk, so I enjoyed it. So hello, everybody. My name is uh, Solitaire, and my voice is not usually this sexy and husky, but I saw Coan for lunch a week ago, so I also have the same cold. Um, my name is Solitaire Townsend. I'm the co-founder of Futera, and I'm here with two fantastic friends, with Esther from Tommy Hilfiger and with Dave from Cow, to talk about innovation and brands. And unfortunately, I'm not here with Justine from Vodafone, who is here in spirit, but is currently on a very delayed flight and extremely disappointed that she can't be here. So I'm going to start this session to lead on from the previous one. Um, about happiness. So I'm Solitaire and I am made happy by being surrounded by the sustainable brands community because it can be pretty lonely out there making a difference and to be in this community with you lot makes me happy. I'm going to art having no preparation I'm going to ask my panelists the same to introduce themselves and tell us what makes them happy. So I'm Esther, I work with Tommy Hilfiger. I'm really happy when I'm sea sailing, but if I'm not on a boat, but in a work situation, because uh, it's not my work, uh, I think what makes me happy is if I, if I see people at work taking, um, making change, uh, sustainable changes that I've inspired them or urged them a little bit to do uh, and own that. That makes me really happy. Brilliant. So, uh, community, seeing people make changes. Say something really boring like chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> no, not chocolate cake. So, I think the first thing that came to mind when you asked was uh, being with fr family and friends. But actually, I think deeper than that is when they are happy. Um, I, th I get a lot of reward and a lot of happiness by seeing them happy for accomplishing something, um, achieving something they wanted to get. Um, that's really, I think, what makes me happy. And you're Dave from the Cow Corporation. Yes, sorry, Dave from Cow. So <laughs> Brilliant. So we're here to talk about leadership. And leadership is often presented a little bit like who's leading the army, who's in front, who's driving change, and very aggressive language. I'd like us to talk to leadership more like a dance. So who is currently taking the lead in the dance between brands and consumers? And I want to set this conversation up with three things which I'm seeing as I go around the world, as I work with our clients, three things that I'm seeing coming from consumers. So one is a massive demand for honesty in this dance. And I say honesty and not transparency. Transparency is about a barrier and how clear or opaque that barrier is between. Uh, is, is the barrier between you and your consumers clear enough they can see in? Honesty is about people and about two human beings talking to each other, about admitting faults, about coming together to create solutions, about asking, about be embodying the value of honesty. The second big theme that I'm seeing, um, and you guys might not have heard this, this um, acronym yet, um, it's an acronym that I call MFSC. MFSC. So consumers are asking for MFFC, which is massive fucking social change. <laughs> now, massive fucking social change does not mean putting a purpose halo around your brand or doing some charitable work. It means really digging into these really serious issues we've got around climate change, around equity, around circularity. So massive fucking social change. I'm just going to keep saying that because it's cute when British people swear. And then the third thing which I'm seeing um, in the world is around Around heroism, who is the hero of this story? Who is the hero of the MFSC? Is it brands? Are you guys the heroes leading, saying onwards, showing the consumer where to go? Or is the consumer herself the hero, the person who's going to make the difference in the world, the person who's going to triumph against the problems we're seeing? And I did a survey recently where I asked consumers whether... Uh, brands were helping them change their own lifestyles. And actually, less than 20% of brands think that you guys are helping. They actually think, in many ways, you're stopping them living sustainably. And of who could blame them? You know, loads of plastic packaging, products that can't be recycled, products that buying plastic crap they didn't need. Like, maybe we're not helping. But 88% of them want you to help. 
88% of consumers want your help for them to be the hero. So the third big theme is heroism. So those three big themes, what I'd really like is perhaps for you guys to answer on one of those themes, how are you responding? What action are you taking? And I'm actually gonna start with Dave because Dave and Cow Corporation is the biggest fucking company you guys have never heard of even though you probably are already buying their products. So Dave, tell us a little bit about Cow, and then tell us a little bit about how you're answering one of those three challenges. Okay, so thank you. And yes, it's, uh, a lot of people don't know our company. Um, so Cow is a Japanese consumer products company. Actually, it's quite old, about 130 years we've been uh, in business. And the, the products we have span everything from baby care to beauty, cosmetics, uh, personal care, household, you name it, as, in terms of uh, consumer products. Highly concentrated in Japan, um, moving into the Asian uh, region, and then also we have businesses in uh, the Americas and EMEA. Here in, uh, in Europe, you might know brands like John Frieda, um, or Ghoul in Germany, or Goldwell in our salon uh, business. So. so in answer to your question, um, you know, I think that uh, we certainly feel that uh, the consumer is the hero. Uh, there's no question in our mind. And I think our brands and our company, we position as more an enabler, right? So we actually have just recently taken the chance to re-express our ESG strategy, um, our sustainability strategy for a company. And while we've done a lot of great things in the past, a lot of it was so centered on what our company was doing, right? We're managing our supply chain better. We're um, you know, de decreasing the amount of CO2 we put out, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we thought we really needed to shift the focus, um, not, fr not so much on what we're doing to make ourselves a better company, but what are we doing to help our consumers live a better life, a more sustainable life? Um, actually, being a Japanese company, we have very interesting ph um, philosophies that we believe in. Um, and one of those is a word called kire. And kire is a very unusual word. It means a lot of different things. It's about cleanliness, it's about well-ordered, it's about beauty all at once. And it's an internal and an external type of, uh, of word. So it means about spirit, but it also means about connecting with people. So what we talk about is in our uh, new strategy is a kire lifestyle. We want to give, we want people to be able to live that wholesome, that holistic, connected, beautiful life, and that's what we're focused on, and we put ourselves as the enablers of them achieving that lifestyle. Well, Kire is damn so easier to say than sustainability lifestyle, um, despite being a Japanese word. So, Esther, how about you? I think that you might disagree with me a little bit on the consumer as the hero, um, uh, or, or, or feel free to answer on one of the others. Um, no, I'm, I might maybe a little bit, or due to our consumers. So let me provide you with a little bit of context. So uh, Tommy Hilfiger is about a $4 billion brand. We're owned by PVH uh, Corp, one of the largest apparel companies in the world, also owns Calvin Klein, for instance. Uh, and within PVH, we have a, a CR platform that stretches across all brands. But uh, as brands, we also have our own specific strategy, right, to emphasize what we think is really important. So over the last year, we've actually defined our third Tommy Hilfiger strategy. Uh, which is really focused on our vision to create fashion that opens minds and closes loops. Uh, and this really refers to the two um, concepts that are most important to us, inclusivity on the one hand and circularity on the other hand. Um, and in the development of that uh, strategy, uh, we also did consumer research because we wanted to, uh, to understand where you know, where can we connect with consumers and what resonates with consumers in the way that we speak about uh, how we feel about the topics. Uh, and one of the things that definitely came up was this honesty, uh, the, hon the, the call for honesty. So I was amazed to see that people are not judgmental. They're not judgmental if they perceive you're not doing anything. Uh, they feel that you, you should do it, but they always feel that you should be very honest. Uh, but what I was surprised about is that they actually want uh, brands to also take a lead, which I don't think they, m they want to be bossed around. That's not what it means. But I do think they want you to have a vision. They want you to take the first steps. And then maybe they'll join in if you provide the opportunity. And they might actually like that a lot. Uh, but they don't want you to put the onus on them and say, like, now you go fix it. Because, like, you know, they're like, no, you fix it. 
you show us what you have and you show us what your plan is. So I think that's definitely something that we saw from our consumer research, uh, which I found really interesting and which we took to heart. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. So this idea that they, that your consumers really want honesty and your consumers really want you to invite them rather than telling them. Let me bounce that back to Dave and so, so with this idea of the Kire lifestyle, is this all about getting the consumer to do something or is it also you taking action? Like, how, where's the balance? Well, at the end, we're, you know, we are trying to get people to change their lifestyles, but we put ourselves in that position of, of helping them do that. And Cal's always been um, interestingly about uh, you know helping uh, people make changes in a seamless way right one in a way that isn't too difficult um, for them so we put the sort of the responsibility on ourselves to find ways to allow them to achieve that goal that sustainable lifestyle without a lot of sacrifice right so that's our job um, that's what I mean by enablers we're responsible for finding a way to allow them to make good choices without too much pain let me double down on that for a second. I'll come back in a moment, Esther, because when I was in Japan recently, one of the things which I saw was that refillables, for example. So um, I go, I buy a shampoo pot, I use it. If I remember, I recycle it from my bathroom into my kitchen where the recycling pot is. But so many companies have tried to get the European consumer to use refillable pots, refillable jars, refillable bathroom. And yet I saw that in Japan, everything's a refillable. Is that just because of the, China, of the Japanese culture, just of how people are, or is that something that's emerged? Well, it's definitely emerged. Um, actually, I've been involved in uh, trying to make refillables a habit around the world. Um, and in Japan, it was a 20-year journey. And so it started out as a very small conversion between the, you know, the regular package and a refillable. But over time, and the con constant innovation, small changes um, can make it easier and easier for people to use it, right? It now is up to 80% um, of the packages purchased in like household or personal care products are refilled packages, the thin film packages. And so that type of conversion can happen, but it took patience and it's a constant innovation. When we tried it in the Western world, unfortunately, it lasted on the market for one year and it was gone. And uh, the patience wasn't there and we weren't able to see that type of continuous innovation. So that's the idea, is to make it easy and keep at it. That's really interesting. Often we think of innovation as being these massive world-changing moments when everything's different. Whereas you're talking about innovation in terms of patience, small innovations over time and not giving up until you get to 80% of the market being refillables. That's exactly right. It, if you think about that, that Kaizen type of um, mentality, right? That constantly, the constant pursuit of perfection you can't get to. Um, but it's, a, it's made up of a myriad of small okay. changes. Salatar, excuse me to interrupt, but we have a question from our activator. Please. Who say that we're always talking about honesty and transparency, but what does it actually mean for a brand? How does that translate into tangible practices? Thank you. Esther. I like the distinction that you made between transparency and between honesty. Um, and I think transparency is about, you know, showing what your practices are, how do you check in with your supply chain, for instance, in our cases. I think honesty is much more about the ups and the downs. So one of the things that we have structured in our uh, vision for 2030 uh, and our strategy is called Make It Possible. So we really believe that we know what kind of brand we want to be in 2030, but we don't know exactly how we're going to get there. Um, and we think that's okay. It's a little scary, but it's okay. Because if you don't have a vision, you're not gonna end up anywhere. So we have that vision, we know how to start it. We have a firm belief that with hard work and determination, we can get there. Uh, that's also how we've built our brand. Uh, but we also think that we need to engage with people along the way. So we don't know all the answers. And I think in order to get the answers that you need, you'll also have to be honest about what you do know, what you don't know. So you'll have to start asking also uh, for input. Um, and this, I think, is for many of us a new, uh, a new process. Uh, and actually, uh, Emmanuel, the, the CEO from uh, Danone this morning, also referred to it. Uh, and I very much recognize it. It's not always comfortable, uh, but it's something that we'll have to start owning. 
And in terms of what Dave was saying about innovation being this incremental process, is innovation an incremental process, or is it, should, it, should we say, you know, Tommy Hilfiger is quite an American brand. Is it more like, yes, we got the solution? No, I think innovation is often also about listening to the consumer. So I already talked about how we did consumer research also to find out, of course, we base our strategy in, in our own brand heritage, but we also want to understand what's important to a consumer. Let me give you a more practical example. So in 2017, we started our adaptive line, um, which is a, a clothing line for people who have uh, disabilities. And one in five uh, people worldwide actually identify as less abled. So for these people, many of these people actually have challenges in the morning just getting dressed or buying clothing and it's not a positive experience for them. Um, you know, and it takes away opportunities for self-expression and, and self-confidence and things like that. So we wanted to do something about that. Uh, but when we started in 2017, we didn't know anything about this. Um, so we actually not only did a lot of focus groups and, and in-depth interviews, but we also worked together with the target community um, to actually develop the innovations that were needed for, for this line. So easy closures, think about Velcro or magnetic closures, but also uh, a special wear for people who have to sit all day or to who have to stow away devices like pumps and stuff like that. And you cannot do these things if you don't engage because uh, we don't have that knowledge. Uh, and it was a super rewarding journey. Actually, our first commercial was made by a, a, a functionally blind director. Um, so we really engaged with, with, these, uh, with the target community there, and it was, it was amazing, the results. I think from the people that shopped that line, 81% is new to our brand. Um, and I think the most staggering stat is that uh, out of all the calls going to our customer service center about this uh, line, is one third is to say thank you. That's amazing. And also 81% new to your brand. Like that's also a fantastic way to bring new people into the brand. Yeah. So Dave, you're sitting there with some stuff in front of you. So we have to ask about the stuff in front of you. Um, uh, Esther's already spoken about circularity. I know that you guys make a lot of personal care products, a lot of household products. We talked about no bullshit. So no bullshit. You guys make a lot of stuff. You make a lot of stuff which is sourced, manufactured, shipped, used then what happens to it afterwards? So we've got a massive waste question hanging over all of us who work in consumer goods. Um, tell us a little bit about this and it, how this might be part of your answer. So, you know, I, there, first of all, there's never one single solution to any of these problems, but in terms of just this massive reduction that we can make in the amount of material we use, so we, are, we took that uh, idea of the film packages that we put together for refills, and you know you, you have a, a piece of, of of plastic film that's so thin. How do you make it into something that can stand up to the rigors of being a principal package and replace all the rest of those? And so we just have come up with this really cool way of doing that. So we use air injected into the film itself, um, and it gives this bottle structure so you can stand up and you can pump it. Um, and then inside there's a bag that that depletes as you go through it. So there's literally zero waste. Um, in terms of the product that's remaining in the, in the package. So this is, again, the kind of the, the continuous evolution, but maybe even a step further. And it always goes back to how do we allow people to make changes in their lives, right? So some people really want that type of a, f of a function. They're not willing to go to a refill. So we think, especially here in the West, where it's been difficult to change people's behavior for, for refills, we can achieve this kind of change, which is a 75% reduction in the amount of plastic through really cool innovation to try to give them the opportunity to not have to change their behavior, yet change the, the real effect they're having on the world. So um, that's really cool. It's very light. It's packaging mainly made of air. Um, is it recyclable? So at the moment, it, it is not, right? It, it, we can, we, in, in Japan, we have a, a process or a, a system we've been working on where we've created um, a way for consumers to recycle uh, film packaging like this. But to make it more accessible and easily recyclable for everybody at scale in the world, we're right now working, if you know these films, they tend to be multiple layers and they can become difficult to uh, recycle. But we're, uh, we're working very aggressively now to have a mono plastic film, so all PET. So it just goes right into the uh, recycle stream like everything, every other piece of PET. So that's in the works and I hope to have that very soon. Brilliant, I want one of those. Um, Esther, we're talking about innovation, um, but we're also talking about brand, brand and consumers. So, so 
the Tommy Hilfiger brand is such a powerful brand worldwide. It's so well recognized. I literally seen some of the tech guys are wearing your Tommy Hilfiger t-shirts. What about the power of your brand to make a change about your power of brand to to bring this to the consumer, to do what you said, which is to actually show the consumer what's possible? I think that is the responsibility of everybody, anybody with a powerful brand, uh, and maybe also of anybody just providing consumer products. So I love this example. I think it's great. Um, we've done a lot of work on sustainable materials. Cotton is our most important fiber. Now, at last year, about 65% of it was sourced more sustainably globally. So we're super proud of that. But we know that you know just making cotton more sustainable isn't enough. Like we'll have to start reusing it because we can't keep regrowing these these ever-growing volumes. So. Last month, we've actually launched our 100% uh, recycled cotton uh, product line, uh, including denims. So that kind of product uh, innovation, I think, is really important. And on the other hand, we'll also have to look at business models um, because there is a, a definite tension between a consumer and also the millennial and the next-gen consumer who are very conscious about how they shop, but there is no less desire for newness or for fashionability there, and I think that will not decline. But at the same time, we all know that resources are actually, uh, you know, scarcer and scarcer. So it doesn't take rocket science to understand that we'll have to look at new business models to provide that newness. And I think that's a super exciting uh, uh, area for brands like us also to, uh, to work in, and we are. And you are. So we're in the last moment or so. So this all sounds beautifully packaged. You've got Kira Lifestyle. You've got um, uh, the new strategy. Was it all as easy as that? Like, was this all like, oh, yes, our consumers are asking for it. Let us do it. W what advice would you give to people who are sitting in this audience going, yeah, great, but I'm really struggling right now to get this stuff through. This isn't landing the way it should do internally. We're only getting to make small changes. Like, I, I know you both. I know you've both fought for this inside your businesses. What would you say to the folks in this room who are also trying to fight the good fight to make a difference in their company? I think my biggest learning personally, which I also found really difficult, is that it doesn't always pay off or work to have a plan ready. Um, if you really want the organization to own it, they have to be able to co-design it. Uh, and then, you know, if you compare it to, to making a meal, I mean, the organization, the people in the organization have to cook it. And you have to enable them actually to sort of co-design the recipe or maybe to make the recipe. But you have to be really, really careful in actually preparing all the ingredients and the kitchen equipment to make sure that it, you know, somehow ends up close to the meal that you had in mind. Um, and you sometimes also have to infuse them with a little love of cooking. But I find most people like cooking when they get the time uh, and the tools. I love that analogy. Dave? Yeah, actually, it's very interesting. We had a very similar journey um, in terms of the creation of this idea. Uh, and it was to be very inclusive with as many people as you can. And that can be very painful, to be honest with you, because you, know, you, you want to get it done, you want to move on, you want to make a decision. But listening letting people get involved, listen, hearing their suggestions and incorporating even the smallest of, of things that is very important to them, I think makes a big difference in terms of ownership and, and the feeling of attachment to the strategy. Uh, but it's still a challenge, and there's no question. And it's, you know, one of the other pieces is that, I think it was mentioned today, education. Um, don't assume everybody has the same understanding of the situation that, that we all do. It's not true. And if they do, even if they have the understanding, don't assume they have the motivation. So we have to help create that with them as well. So education and, and drive from the top of the organization to get it done. Brilliant. Massive fucking social change in big and small steps. Thank you so much, Esther. Thank you so much, Dave.